I am Karen Dina Sale with the Community Technical Assistance Center at the New York University Silver School of Social Works McSilver Institute. And I would like to welcome you to today's training called Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, CPTSD in Young Adults. So I'm thinking that all of you signed in to participate today because this is really important to you. And I think it is one of the most important topics of our time right now. Um, I was looking far and wide for somebody to present. So we're really grateful to have our presenter with us today. During today's important training, we will learn about the historical overview of the development of our understanding of trauma, differentiating PTSD from complex trauma, the characteristics of complex PTSD, and the implications for treatment planning and the clinical alliance. Before we get started, I just want everyone to know that you've been placed on mute, but we do we love our chat box. So please chat to us anything that you have to say or any questions you may have. We will be collecting questions throughout our time together, um, and we'll have a, a about a 10-minute Q&A at the end. If you have any technical issues during today's event, please chat to our host, who will be able to assist you. Her name is Vanessa. And for the best viewing experience, you can go to the top right corner and click view and click side-by-side -side colon speaker. That will be your best viewing experience. So you'll see just our presenter, Dr. Jillian O'Shea Brown and uh, her slides for today. I just wanna thank Dr. Jillian O'Brown so very much for participating today as our presenter. Um, she is an EMDRI Emedria certified therapist and consultant, which means she's trained in EMDR and has been using it for many years. She authored the book, Healing Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, A Clinician's Guide, which has been featured in international media outlets, including Vogue, Huffington Post, Mary Claire and Thrive. Dr. O'Shea Brown's doctoral research at NYU has enriched her understanding of attachment injury acquired through adverse childhood events and the treatment of complex layered trauma in adulthood. She currently serves as an adjunct professor of trauma at NYU and will be offering professional development courses on the treatment and healing of complex trauma uh, beginning in st the spring of 2023. So welcome again, and Dr. Jillian O'Shea Brown, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much for having me today. And I just have to say that it is, um, it's really amazing to see so many therapists that are committed to learning more about complex trauma. Kara uh, has already given a run through of what we'll be covering today. Um, I know that some of you have carved time out of your busy working day and you're probably sneaking a little bit of lunch now or a late breakfast. I'm going to start with a grounding technique. And the reason why is to quote Peter Levine, no healing from trauma can occur until you feel safe in your body. Also, you will be aware of the power. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, we are getting people texting that they can't hear you. Oh, like, is there, I'm, is there I'm, a way that you could speak up or move closer to your microphone? I'm so sorry. I just wanted to make sure people can hear you and get the most out of this. Okay, I'm a bit closer now. Does this work? Yes, they can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay, perfect. So um, just going back a little bit, I am going to begin with a grounding technique. And the reason why, uh, to quote Peter Levine, no healing from trauma can occur until you feel safe in your body. And I know that some of you are maybe having um, a late breakfast, early lunch, taking time from your working day. But I'll ask that during the grounding technique that you allow yourself to fully engage with it, have the experience. And as trauma therapists, you will understand the importance of somatic resonance. If you are anchored and neutral in your body, you want the client to sync up with you. So it's care of self and care of client. And we will be referring back to the grounding technique throughout the session. So I'd like you to fully have that experience. So we're gonna do a very quick exercise that's called the four elements. It was created by Elon Shapiro in 2012. And the first thing I'm gonna have you do is sink into your chair Hi, Dr. O'Shea Brown. I'm so sorry. I still have people in the chat saying that they're having trouble hearing. They say that they can't hear you and their volume is at um 100%. Hmm. Um, let me see. 
I'm just checking my audio settings here. Sorry. Okay, is this better? Yes, yeah, I think that, let, me, let me. Yes, in the chat they're saying much better. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, we're going to start with a very quick grounding technique. I, I do hope that you will allow yourself to engage with it because we will refer back to it throughout the talk. So closing your eyes, feet on the ground, take three deep breaths. Surrendering to gravity, I just want you to allow the weight of your body to be supported by the chair underneath you. Connecting with the element of earth. The next element I want to bring to your awareness is air. Take a moment to breathe in through the nose, out through birthday candle lips. Repeat this. Noticing a little bit of diaphragmatic movement. The breathing and the heartbeat work in synchronicity. If you ever want to slow down your heartbeat, you can do so by slowing down your breathing. Noticing the temperature of the room and the sound of your breathing. Connecting with the elements of earth and air, I also want to bring your awareness to water. Take a moment to check and see if it's possible to create saliva in your mouth. And if it is, take a moment to notice that. When you can create saliva in your mouth, it's your way of knowing that you're here, you're safe, your digestive enzymes are turned on, the body's in a state of deep rest and repair. It's for this reason that people often get offered a glass of water or a cup of tea during an emergency or a crisis because the body knows that when you can create this moisture in the mouth, that you're safe. Connecting with the elements of earth underneath you, air all around you, water in your mouth. I now want you to envision a beautiful torch, Olympian torch. And as you see this torch, you're being led down a tunnel or a pathway. And when you get to the other side, you arrive in a place of beautiful transcendent healing. It could be somewhere of natural beauty, somewhere you've been before, somewhere you'd like to go. And when you arrive there, I want you to survey your surroundings, taking in the colors, the textures, the sounds, There could be a scent. Looking up at the sky, maybe you're aware of the season or the time of day. Also noticing how you feel in your body and allowing yourself to take this all in from a place of safety. Letting it linger for just a few breaths. And then very, very slowly coming back into the room by opening your eyes. So those of you that were able to follow along, I want to just extend some appreciation to you. It's not easy to do in front of strangers. And um, some of you might have been able to think of a place of natural beauty that feels comforting to you. Um, others might have felt distracted or it might have lost you along the way. If you had a positive experience of that, I want you just to notice how good that feels and how ready you feel to take in your client. If you weren't able to get there, know that there are so many different ways of creating a sense of comfort in the room. And this is just one avenue. Usually I would pick people from the crowd and ask their experiences and reflect back. But because we have um, under an hour today, we are a little bit pressed for time. So to begin, uh, trauma informs identity, not just to the development of maladaptive behaviors, such as hypervigilance and psychological reactivity, but also to the formation of shame-based cognition. Today, we're going to look at the whole constellation of trauma symptoms, but let's go back to the earliest mention of trauma, which was from Shakespeare. 
I'm not a Shakespearean actor, but I'm gonna do my very best to read this to you. My good Lord, why are thus alone? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth and start so often when thou sits alone? In thy faint slumbers, I by thee have watched and heard thee murmur tales of iron war. Thou hastn't talked of sallies and retires, of trenches, tents, of prisoners ransom and soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. Thy spirit within thee had been so at war, and thus had so bestirred thee in thy sleep that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow like bubbles in a late disturbed stream. So what we're seeing here from Shakespeare's Henry IV is a concerned wife's observations of her husband's symptoms of post-traumatic stress. He's anticipating returning back to the battlefield. There's sleep disturbance, night terrors, flashbacks, pervasive shame-based cognition, and survivor's guilt. So post-traumatic stress is not a new thing. It has, it's a tale as old as time. But we are at a period in history where we're really beginning to understand relationally the impacts of complex PTSD. So just taking you on a little bit of a journey through time, uh, Shakespeare's Henry IV and Homer would be, you know, some of the early mentions of trauma. And then we have Pierre de Janet, who was a French pioneering psychologist and one of the first to formulate a systematic therapeutic approach, um, which was eclectic and phase oriented. He also spoke a lot about how trauma leaves behind clues. The traumatized mind is fragmented. When you're compassionately witnessing the story of a traumatized person, you'll get feeling states, uh, emotions, aspects of the story, and then you'll get a lot of fog. And it was uh, Pierre de Janet that really first spoke about um, disassociation, the disconnection from reality temporarily as a defense mechanism. Coming down from that, we have um, Sigmund Freud, who offered uh, a lot of wisdom in terms of repetition compulsion, which I'm gonna get into later, uh, catharsis, repression, memories below conscious awareness. And he believed that events in our childhood have a great influence on our adult lives and in shaping our personalities. Um, anxiety and post-traumatic stress from an earlier time and can remain dormant and inform our behaviors. And then we have Carl Jung, um, who, you know, the cornerstone of trauma work is that you are taking a person on a journey of compassionately witnessing themselves from a place of safety. So when you're peeling back the layers, you inevitably are going to encounter the inner child. The inner child was a term that Carl Jung coined, and he proclaimed that within every adult is an eternal child that is perpetually in a state of becoming more, requiring unceasing care and attention and education, and that they are vulnerable, creative, playful, expressive, and in need of tenderness. And it is this dual awareness of compassionately witnessing the inner child from a place of safety that is really at the heart of all of the trauma modalities. So um, English physician Charles Myers initially became very curious about veterans coming back from war and they seem to have an interesting constellation of symptoms, which he surmised was from con concussive blasts. And the constellation of symptoms included alcoholism, substance abuse, mood disorder, hypervigilance, flashbacks, um, anger, even schizophrenia. He was trying to group these together and he came up with the initial diagnosis, shell shock. However, it was disproven because even the soldiers that did not have direct physical trauma still carried the remnants of some of these experiences. Um, and it wasn't until 1980 
um, when Vietnam veterans, with the help of New York psychoanalysts, um, successfully lobbied the APA to recognize post-traumatic stress in the, in the DSM. Looking at how PTSD presents at the moment in the DSM, and I'm aware that there are some therapists outside of the US here today that are going with the ICD, which is miles ahead. Um, so bear with me for this piece. There are four kind of main symptom clusters. One is reoccurrent experiencing of the traumatic event to nightmares, intrusive thoughts, physiological reactivity. This is very much like a skipping disc or a skipping vinyl, depending if there's any young adults here today, I'm sure you don't play around with discs, um, where the most painful part of the memory keeps coming up. Uh, the most painful images, feeling states, sensations, and it comes up intrusively, um, but it's not, it never plays out to a point of resolution. And by point of resolution, I mean when you return back to a place of safety. Avoidance of thoughts, triggers, reminders of the trauma, commonly known as triggers. Anything that looks like, feels like, or seems like that time when you were at real and active threat. Negative cognition and mood. Um, which is you know, often connected with shame-based feelings. Arousal and reactivity in the form of hypervigilance and, and an exaggerated startle response. Um, so you know, this is very characteristic of you know, that feeling of walking on eggshells and not feeling very safe. And um, PTSD was helpful in creating an understanding of single incident trauma including intrusion trauma, rape, physical assault, traumatic experiences from war. However, it didn't really accurately portray the impacts of interpersonal prolonged traumatization beginning in childhood. And you know some of the secondary symptoms that can result from this, something was missing. And when we go back and we look at how the word trauma was first originated, you know, wounds of a physical or psychological nature, the easiest way for us to think about complex trauma is a debt by a thousand cuts. There's big T traumas and there's small T traumas. Complex trauma tends to be a little bit more sinister, insidious, hidden, um, communication deviance, walking on eggshells, um, pathological accommodation, all of these interpersonal situations, which time and time again can erode your sense of self. Complex trauma is used to describe chronic long-term traumatization, the experience of multiple or prolonged developmentally adverse events um, arising from childhood abuse, neglect, or exposure to domestic violence. Um, Judith Herman, an American psychiatrist was one of the first to shine a light on how complex trauma is different and unique from classic PTSD. She offers this very powerful quote, and I'd like you to take a moment just to really take in the words and notice how they land with you. Many children, many abused children cling to the hope the growing up will bring escape and freedom, but the personality formed in an environment of coercive control is not well adapted to adult life. The survivor is left with fundamental problems in basic trust, autonomy, initiative. As an adult, the survivor is burdened by major impairments in self-care, in cognition, in memory, in identity, and in the capacity to form stable relationships. They remain a prisoner of their childhood, attempting to create new life, but still re-encountering the trauma. So if you think about that key term, prisoner of childhood, children don't have the luxury of saying, this is a really toxic relationship. I think I'm going to uh, take some space or establish some boundaries. Um, they are interdependent with the person that is causing them pain. And, and this leaves them in a very difficult position. Um, they have to learn to accommodate. They have to repress their emotions to maintain proximity to their caregiver. 
uh, they have to mold around the environment, survival to adaptation, because they really don't have many choices. And this, you know, really shone a light on what differentiates complex clustered relational trauma with a single incident trauma. So how are they the same and how are they different? PTSD is single incident. Complex PTSD is exposure to chronic prolonged threat and instability, often of an interpersonal nature, death by a thousand cuts. Um, PTSD, there's loss of memory of aspects of the trauma. Again, trauma leaves behind clues where there is different parts of the story, feeling states, aspects, emotions that are present, but not a whole narrative. With complex trauma, you might have even larger time gaps, not a lot of memories of the past, but a lot of feeling states. Whatever access point you can have, you, you begin from. You, you work from where the client is at, where the survivor is at. Some disassociation, uh, there is more disassociative experiencing for complex trauma survivors. And what is characteristic of both is hypervigilance, avoidance, and re-experiencing. However, for the survivor of complex trauma, there's going to be a lot more affect dysregulation, which I'm going to go into in a while. Uh, relational difficulties. If your trauma happened in the context of a relationship, then trusting relationally, expressing vulnerability, forging closeness, trusting in another, this is all going to be very activating. It's going to be very frightening. Um, they want to avoid closeness um, because this could be intrusive or scary, or um, it could activate abandonment. Um, there was also a lot of negative self-concept, um, shame-based cognition. So um, complex PTSD is, character is defined by symptom cl clusters mainly resembling PTSD, um, but the shame-based cognition, despair, somatization, and withdrawal are key aspects. And if you think about it, the opposite of Expression is depression, numbness, and uh, not expressing, keeping everything inside. Um, so a lot of complex trauma survivors are both disconnected from themselves and others and their bodies and feeling a lot of loneliness. And the DSM-4 field trial petitioned to have complex trauma entered in as a unique diagnosing, diagnosis for all of these above reasons. Um, however, because of reasons of symptom overlap, it was never really accepted or included uh, until the ICD-11 uh, formally included it this year, this January. And we're hoping that the DSM will follow suit. So coming back to the feeling states, um, I opened up today's session with a picture of uh, Sedona, Arizona. And the reason why is that is a place where I have a very key memory of looking at a beautiful mountain and not thinking about the past, not thinking about the, pre the future, but just being totally in the present. And this diagram I'm showing you, it looks much more complicated than it actually is. In the center is your window of tolerance. And this is where you are when you feel most yourself. Some people feel this way when they're laughing with a friend, creative writing, going for a jog, reading a book, um, going on vacation. And this is when you feel your heart is calm, your breathing is calm, you have lateral thinking, you might be playful, you might have imaginative thoughts, you're, you're comfortable in your own skin. So hypothetically, if you were in the forest, and you were being chased by a bear and there was a sudden threat, you would become hyper aroused. Your heartbeat would speed up. Your thoughts would become a bit more cyclical. Um, there would be emotional reactivity. Your body would be going into fight or flight and you would be what's known as hyper aroused. But if you don't, if, if you're not being chased with the bear, if you live with that bear, um, if that bear is, let's say, an abusive family member, it's no longer adaptive for the body to be in a state of hyperarousal. 
when the body's in fight or flight, you're not really getting the energy for your immune system, for digestion, for deep cleansing and repair. It is purely a survival instinct. So the body shuts down. It goes more hypo because you can't live pervasively in a state of hyperarousal. And when you're hypo, you feel disconnected. You feel numb. In the animal kingdom, they would call this the primal surrender or playing dead, um, where you don't really feel connected to yourself, your body. You feel detached. So a lot of the time, you have to figure out with your um, complex trauma clients, where are they in this modulation model? Going back to the words of Peter Levine, no healing from trauma can occur until you feel safe in your body. So um, this is from my book and it's just a little bit of a synopsis of how you would recognize how a person feels in their body. If they're very hyper aroused, then there's going to be intense emotions, anger, irritability, fear, sleep disturbance, difficulty concentrating. What was I saying again? Um, Hypervigilance, feeling on guard, heightened impulsivity, muscle tension, increased heartbeat, feeling jumpy, shortness of breath, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts. And when you see this, you have to name it, you know, I'm noticing that you seem very activated today. Can I offer you a grounding technique or exercise for us to do together? And this kind of compassionate witnessing, comfort checking, consent seeking, and noticing is what's going to help um, a person to come back into their body. Um, hypo arousal can be a little bit more different in terms of noticing that you might notice um, disconnection from emotions, flat affect, um, memory fragmentation, numbing, disassociation from self, from the body, from emotions, again, sleep disturbance, difficulty concentrating um, and low energy. And once again, noticing these and and you know observing them and offering a technique to create more mindfulness in the room can bring a person into their their place of comfort their um optimal arousal zone so that the deeper work can begin because you want a person feeling present and the more strategies you teach them i always love when clients come in and they tell me you know i was on the subway and i got really activated and I used a strategy and I brought myself back and I was really surprised that I had the power to do that. So the body becomes less the enemy and more the friend it might be an overly protective friend with a lot of defense mechanism. But by understanding that the body is always trying to support and protect and this can create a more harmonious relationship. Complex trauma work involves a lot of psychoeducation about the body, about why the body reacts in certain ways, how memories get stored in the body, um, and how you can regain control over your body. For a lot of trauma survivors, the body can be a source of pain, shame, and intrusion. And they might also feel very disconnected from their bodies. Um, Research from um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study found that survivors of childhood trauma um, developed a high risk maladaptive behaviors, difficulty establishing and maintaining relationships, uh, psychological distress, and poor physical health. Um, a lot of survivors of adverse childhood experiences have the impulse to ritualistically compulsively comfort seek, uh, also known as addiction. This can come in different forms. It could be promiscuity, it could be online shopping, it could be substances. And the question is, you know, not why are you addicted, but what is it that you're trying not to feel? And behind every behavior is a feeling and behind every feeling is a need. And the compassionate inquiry, inquiry of the why and allowing a person to slowly reveal themselves to you is incredibly important. 
um, because to quote Michelangelo, uh, the angel was always in the marble. I just carved until I set it free. Um, people know deep down why they choose certain behaviors or um, ritualistic comfort seeking activities or defense mechanisms. There's always a protective reason. And being the compassionate witness and the non-judgmental guide, you're going to get a lot more information, you know? So a little mixture of psychoeducation and compassionate witnessing and inquiry is incredibly important. So when you're talking to a person with complex trauma, you're listening very carefully for their I am beliefs, the emotional map of the world. And um, classically, when you have interpersonal trauma or childhood abuse, there's gonna be a self-concept, a self-story that could be, you know, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough, I'm a bad person, I'm not in control, I'm not safe. When you hear this with someone, um, writing down the cognition, and asking a person, you know, like it's a timeline and you're writing the headlines like a newspaper three to five times in their life and they're made to feel this way, it becomes the bite that fits the wound. There's an early event that plants a negative belief that gets reactivated over time. And every time it gets activated, it's just as painful, if not more, from the time before. And this cumulative impact of feeling not good enough or unlovable creates a lot of negative beliefs, toxic shame, uh, distrust of yourself and others. Uh, with this particular exercise, you get to take the belief and uh, identify which memories led to the belief. And then what we would usually do from there is we would look at the memories separately like you're untangling necklaces one strand at a time, just looking at one memory at a time for processing. This particular exercise can be very exposing for people. So I like to follow it up with, you know, if the negative belief is I'm not good enough, what's the belief you would rather have about yourself instead? And if it's, you know, I am good enough as I am, or I am worthy of love, or I can ask for what I need and still be lovable. And you would ask them three to five times when they felt this way, and then really look at installing that feeling state. Um, and this is a little bit of the mapping and the treatment planning of complex trauma. You know, looking at the emotional map, the self-concept, identifying core memories, and you want to clear the past before looking at present day triggers. And then you can create future template work, the North Star. So a little bit on um, the shame that comes with trauma. We're going to look at Freud, Fairborn, and trauma, repetition, compulsion, and the moral defense against bad objects. So um, starting with Fairborn, he was a Scottish psych a psychiatrist in the 1940s, and he was interested in, you know, researching children that were survivors of abuse. The children he interviewed were blatantly being abused at home. Uh, some even had physical markings, but he was curious why they all had the same story. You know, they would all say, well, I'm a bad kid. And if I was better, I wouldn't be hurt. And he was interested in this defensive strategy where there's a kind of a fallacy of control where if I take the blame, and if I say that I'm bad, then I can create a narrative where I have some control over the situation. Because children have so little control, this created um, a sense of responsibility. But if you continuously blame yourself and take responsibility for others' behaviors towards you, abusive behaviors, this is gonna create shame. Uh, it's my fault is gonna turn into I am bad. And that shame will be internalized into adulthood, uh, into young adulthood and, and beyond. And then for Freud, you know, he coined the term repetition compulsion. And 
the simplest way that I can describe this is that if we all got in a circle and put our problems in the circle, we would choose our own problems again um, because we have a desire to resolve them. We want to solve them. We want to gain mastery. We want to rewrite the past, return back to an earlier state of things. And we, you know, we have an unconscious desire to go towards the familiar. And it's for this reason that sometimes people inadvertently and below conscious awareness relive their childhood trauma in romantic partnerships, in other relationships. We accept the love we believe we deserve. And when your emotional map um, creates feeling states that you're unworthy, not good enough, you don't deserve to have boundaries, you're a bad person, then inevitably this plays out in early adulthood. It can play out in the clinical relationship. And um, there is often a pervasive pattern in a person's life. And the cognitions, the I am beliefs will reveal that to you. So specifically with young adults, um, many of them will still be reliant on their parents for financial and practical support. This means that negotiating boundaries is very challenging. When you're doing complex trauma work, you often have to um, have delicate conversations around the relationships in a person's life um, rather than negotiating boundaries, because you would never do that with a stranger. You only do that with people that you love and care about. Um, you kind of have to reword it to, um, I want to find a way of getting closer to you automatically the defense mechanism goes down and a person is more willing to hear you. Um, delicate conversations, they may seem small, actually have massive ramifications in a person's life, their emotional map of the world, their relationships with themselves and others. And for the young adults of today, um, Due to positive role modeling, they are more likely to ask for help and explore compassionate witnessing. Um, they have been receiving a lot of psycho ed online uh, from therapists and survivors. Um, so they are quite informed, um, but then the quality of the psycho education can be um, unmonitored. So, you know, sometimes it's very high quality, sometimes not. Um, but I believe that young adults are becoming more and more aware of relational trauma and the need for to heal the wounds of the past so you can live more fully in the now. So um, complex trauma, the negative effects of layered relational trauma um, has been recognized in the ICD-11 and um, it has the core elements of PTSD such as the deliberate avoidance of internal and external reminders and hypervigilance and hyperarousal. However, it also includes the persistent negative views of the self, uh, the shame-based cognition, the interpersonal challenges uh, of difficulty forming and maintaining relationships, uh, establishing trust, expressing vulnerability and uh, connecting. And, um, the endorsement began earlier this year, um, but because prior to this time, there was no shared terminology behind all the research papers, um, there has been different understandings of what constitutes complex PTSD. So this change really symbolizes um, a bright new beginning for research on the evidence-based modalities for treating uh, complex PTSD. So implications for treatment planning um, is if the nature of the trauma is relational, creating a safe space, a trusting relationship is the most challenging thing. And what you want a lot of is self-determination. Um, so you're doing a lot of asking permission. Would you like to? Which memory would you like to process first? Um, can I offer you a grounding technique? Would that be helpful to you? You're really creating a sense of self-awareness and mastery because you want the trauma survivor to act out of deep self-awareness rather than classic conditioning. 
Uh, the young adult, especially, their classic conditioning might be to pathologically accommodate, not have thoughts of their own, go along with the authority figure, rather than to go within their own self-awareness and wisdom and trust that they know exactly what they need in order to begin to overcome the pain of the past. Um, you're guiding the client in their decision making and offering choice to create a sense of empowerment uh, in a synergistic way. The way you do all one thing is the way you do all things. If you role model this in the clinical alliance, the hope is that the survivor will bring this into all of their other relationships and become more comfortable coming to voice. Establishing safety of the body through psychoeducation uh, and choices and awareness is very important. And it's important to under promise and over deliver. You don't want to give false hope. And unfortunately, there is quite a lot of false information about trauma processing out there where people can are sometimes led to believe it's a very quick process. Um, but when trauma happens, you know, it's often fast and painful and re repeated. And in contrast, healing can be a slow and gentle process. It can appear that way. Um, the treatment of complex trauma should be phase-oriented, multimodal, and skill-focused, with a core emphasis on symptom relief and functional improvement. Um, and the goal is to create safety in the body, to create a kind of an understanding of the emotional map and then to work through those memories individually. It was Francine Shapiro, the founder of EMDR that said, we have 10 to 20 memories in our life responsible for all of the pain and processing just one is like taking one log out of the fire. So we kind of slowly, you know, process each of these memories. So when you're assessing uh, a client for complex PTSD, um, what I like to do is I like to do the ACE questionnaire, the Adverse Childhood Experiences questionnaire with, with the client. Um, so I can kind of understand a little bit about what those formative years were like. The PCL5 is what's used in the DSM, but the International Trauma Questionnaire was designed specifically for complex PTSD. And this talks a lot about feeling states, the I am beliefs, the self story, the relationship with the body. It connects on disassociation and um, it's very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Depending on who the client is, the scale of disassociative experiences is very helpful, especially if people had a lot of intrusion trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma, um, or they just feel very disconnected from their body. Um, I personally, with my clients, like to do the love languages questionnaire because survivors of complex trauma are trying to learn how to love and be loved in a safe and trusting way. And the more they know about their own needs, uh, whether that's, you know, words of affirmation, time investment, acts of service, um, the more that they can learn to connect with, you know, the people in their life that matter. Um, and it's, it's a kind of a fun exercise that creates an element of self-awareness. And during the beginning of working with someone with complex trauma, I do like to interweave some questions from the adult attachment interview. Uh, for example, you know, to give five adjectives to describe the relationship you had with both parents. I do add a little bit of a caveat in that I also have them describe their past romantic partnerships just to see if there's repetition compulsion there. The treatment options for complex PTSD um, would be, you know, the World Health Organization recommended in 2013 that EMDR and uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy were the recommended treatments for PTSD. Uh, complex trauma is a little bit more different, specifically in the relationship a person has with their body and the difficult relationship they will have with their own wounded inner child. And for that reason, the body-based modalities, somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, 
And the ego state um, modalities like internal family systems can really enrich the work. It's a kind of a holistic integrated framework where there's an appreciation of the mind body connection. And you can really, you know, work from where the client is at. Um, every client that lives with complex trauma is going to have a unique experience of how those symptoms manifest. And they will all choose a different pathway in terms of their healing process. And the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more you can create a personalized blend that is suitable to that particular client. So the efficacy of EMDR in the treatment of PTSD has been well established and, and evidenced with over uh, 30 positive randomized control studies. Um, the initial stages um, of mapping out the history, uh, compassionate inquiry, creating safety in the body, that's the same for a lot of clients. Um, but then from there, depending on where a person is at, if there's an active addiction, if there's um, a lot of impulsivity, you might just stay with grounding and stabilization. And it, the important thing with complex trauma is that the healing process can work a little bit slower um, in that the relational piece of creating a safe space, awareness of the self, safety in the body, and the ability for the client to compassionately witness themselves, um, psychoeducation around terms of communication deviance, dysfunctional family systems, how manipulation can work. This can all be very, very... Sorry, bear with me. This can all be very helpful in empowering um, the survivor uh, so that their self-awareness will allow them to connect with their own innate healing wisdom. So um, I want to apologize because um, this is adapted from my book, which was a just under 28 hour course um, and brevity is not my strong point. So, I've given you a lot of information and it's kind of a broad but shallow um, understanding of trauma. And what I'm really hoping is that you take away from this that, you know, you've learned a little bit more, but you have more curiosity. I personally feel that I will always be a student in this field, that I will always be learning. The field is growing so quickly and evolving so quickly. Um, that I hope that what you have learned today is just bringing up a lot of questions of, oh, I want to look into this more. I want to learn more about this. This is a skill I'd like to develop. If you do decide that you'd like to learn more, I'm going to be starting a trauma healer circle uh, this spring. So you can just reach out to me on my, on my website if you'd like to join. Um, a lot of today's information is coming from my book. Um, specifically chapters three and chapters four. And um, if there are questions that people have from today, because I'm aware that I threw a lot of information at you, um, I just want to open up the space and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillian. This was really incredible. And I'm just looking at the chat. A lot of people have chatted in questions and are still talking and are really grateful for all the information and do feel that they absolutely have more questions uh, to ask. And um, I'm wondering if you could just, we could just look at a few of these. Um, someone was asking those who come back from war, is war considered a single event? Is it only CPTSD if you have multiple tours? Um. That's a very complicated question. And um, the first thing I'd like to caveat it with is that a lot of people, um, when they're going into the military, very, very young, um, we have no idea what home they're leaving, what experiences they had in their childhood, experiences of not being in control, not feeling safe. Um, and it's these feeling states being activated repeatedly uh, that creates complex trauma. So I think that most people that are coming back from serving, 
They have repeatedly been activated over and over again. They haven't been allowed to express or be compassionately witnessed. Um, they've had to suppress a lot of their pain, um, you know, with you know, feelings of uh, toxic masculinity, or if it's it, it, women within the military or um, non-binary individuals, um, you're just not really allowed to have that catharsis. So, you know, the debt by a thousand cuts would be very real there. Um, I think it would be impossible to serve and come back with just a single incident trauma. Uh, Carrie, you're muted. I apologize. Thank you so much. Sorry, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thank you for that answer. It makes a lot of sense. Um, how do another question? How do I assist a young client with mastery to look within when she is at the mercy of adults in her life? There are a lot of you have tos, et cetera, in her life. And so trying to figure out how to help her to look within and feel safe in her body is yes. what it sounds like. This is uh, one of the most challenging pieces of work with young adults in that you're assisting them to navigate the trauma while they're still in the eye of the storm. Um, I, even though you can't take the pain away, you can take the walk with them. For this particular client, I would still continue to do the affect regulation work of finding safety in the body, learning the schemas, attaching them to memories. And then I also like to do almost like concentric circles who is the network of support around this young child? Um, are there protective factors and risk, risk factors in their life? Um, depending on the nature and the severity of the trauma, you know, it also might go beyond the, um, the therapy room to involve, um, you know, mandated reporting. Um, but it is always appreciated when people explain their dysfunctional family systems and you can tell them this is actually, you know, this is triangulation, this is communication deviance, this is a loyalty bond. And you're really showing them that you, you understand them and that they are, you know, collateral damage in that hurricane and that they are in that eye of the storm. And being that person that is the compassionate witness it can be incredibly healing, but you are dealing with a very complicated piece of work in that it's not necessarily that they're looking back at themselves from a place of safety because the trauma is ongoing. And that is the most challenging type of trauma work that you can do, whether it's in a domestic violence situation or a dys dysfunctional family home for a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do know that having one safe adult uh, in that person, that young person or child's life is incredibly important. So uh, maybe helping to find that person or even being that person goes a very long way, right? Absolutely. And, you know, finding opportunities with the child to expand those opportunities, to connect with, you know, safe individuals that are understanding, that don't pose a threat, that uh, create a sense of positive role modeling. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a, a few more questions. One is, how do you assess whether uh, EMDR is, is right for somebody in treatment? Are the, is there an assessment to do to, uh, as to whether it would be helpful for them? So first off, um, the person has to decide themselves, you know, when they know what it is and they know their past, if they're ready. Um, the first uh, few stages of EMDR in terms of history taking, finding safety in the body, identifying memories. A lot of people can tolerate this much, but people that have active you know, impulsivity or there's a risk of suicide, self-harm, addiction, we tend to stay in the resource development longer. So it's a softer, gentle, more gradual approach of creating safety and really harnessing them um, to feel in control. So, um, even if a person is not going to the full eight phases of EMDR, if they're just going to the beginning resource development, that can be very, very helpful. Um, if you are the primary therapist and you're doing a referral for conjunctive therapy, you would just absolutely let that therapist know of your concerns. And then you would co-work the case um, very closely 
um, so that there is um, a circle of support around the client. Okay, great. Um, I do want to say that we did a webinar on positive resourcing. If you, anybody would like to go onto our website and find that, um, it was it was a really wonderful uh, webinar that could accompany this. Uh, I do want to. I need. Can you go to the next slides? I need to go over the CE information for everyone. And people are wondering if you have an email or website you want to chat in, that would be really helpful. So these are our upcoming events, Managing Trauma with Multi-Generational Latinx Families on September 27th. And then we have an ACES brochure that we released last month in English. We will be releasing it at the end, by the end of September in Spanish. And then the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, so many of you were asking. So this, I'm so sorry, I forgot to mention in the beginning that you are eligible for one CE uh, if you are participating in today's webinar. And these are the instructions. They will be emailed to you as well. Um, and you have to be a licensed social worker or LMHC to receive a CE. And we're really grateful for you, uh, Dr. O'Shea Brown, for going through everything we need for the CEs. Um, you will have to register, create a username and password, at uh, the NYU Silver CE online portal, uh, and then you'll register for your CE and there's a processing fee. If you could go to the next slide. And then uh, again, all of this will be emailed to you, but just so we can, you can understand that it is something that you are able to do. Um, that you'll receive confirmation email and then there's a whole process in place and then you'll get your CE um, afterwards. One more question. It looks like we have time for one more. I just wanted to get to that. And I think this is really important in regards to BIPOC communities, people of color. How do these techniques differ for other people, indigenous communities? So a lot of other people were chatting in that these uh, techniques feel like they're really grounded in, in white Western world. Is there a way that we could think about them for all people? Yeah. yeah. So there's kind of two key pieces. Um, one is to assume a social constructivist lens when it comes to systematic oppression and racial trauma. Um, don't make any assumptions, but lead with curiosity and allow a person to reveal their experience to you because every person has a different experience of systematic oppression and racial trauma and allow them to, you know, let you know. I've also had students um, therapy students who are white with BIPOC clients feel ill-equipped. Um, but compassion and curiosity and really giving the person the space to let you know all of the layers of their trauma is very important. Um, I would also say that uh, what is different is that um, attachment theory would say that you have to have one stable, predictable, reliable source of caregiving. And the big critique against that is that in the Afrogenic model, you have constellations of women that are multi-generational that can support or, or be involved with caregiving connection, uh, family relationships. So um, attachment theory can be uh, biased towards Western belief systems, um, but who, when you come to a person with the intention of compassionately witnessing, not making any assumptions, allowing them to reveal themselves to you, and, and then, you know, really empowering them to ask for what they need and be the master of their own healing process. And um, that is very important because you're not always going to have perfect, um, alliance with your client's lived experience. And that's where your transferable skills are very important. And, and sometimes there is a reason why people choose particular therapists. Sometimes people, um, I actually in my practice have a lot of uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, clients because there's a freedom of going to someone outside of your community sometimes, or somebody that doesn't have that lived experience. And, you know, just kind of asking and, and being very open and um, allowing a person to reveal themselves to you in their own words. I hope that answers your question, but you're, you're right. Um, there does need to be some more specialized protocols. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to leave everyone with this last thought. We, I was chatting with someone about, um, they were saying that bipolar, uh, borderline personality disorder can look like uh, complex PTSD. Yeah. Um, and I said, it could also be the other way around. And I think that I'm sure this is a conversation you've had many times and not only uh, borderline personality disorder, but other diagnoses uh, that, that may be confused for CPTSD. So I think that would be a beautiful conversation for another time. I just wanted to touch on it because I do think it's really important. And if you have any last words about that or anything, we'd love to hear them. Okay, well, you know, the thing about borderline personality disorder is that it does make it difficult to maintain relationships and to trust. And there's an abandonment wound that gets activated that can, you know, activate anger, distrust, or sharp emotions. And it tends, there, there is definitely a Venn diagram between the two. And the complex PTSD is very much about how events of the past are creating challenges in the present. And I believe that if you were to sit down with someone with borderline personality as a compassionate and curious witness for long enough, you are definitely going to be led down the pathway of relational trauma because people don't develop an abandonment wound out of nowhere. Um, I also feel that some of the cornerstones of borderline, such as splitting, where you tend to over idealize and then scrutinize uh, individuals, that's not always present in complex trauma. It's, it's in fact, you know, rarely present. So there are some key aspects that are definitely connected to complex trauma, but I do believe that it is its own unique diagnosis that is separate but similar to complex PTSD. Great, thank you. And I, last thing, we did have a very beautiful uh, comment that was chatted in with somebody who was in recovery uh, and said that this has really uh, been a light bulb moment for them uh, as a provider, but also in their own personal journey. And they're really grateful. And I think a lot of people are chatting in. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. So on that note, I just want to thank you again and thank you everyone for participating today and join us for our future events and we'll see you soon. Thank you.